a solution. We'll also assess the challenges facing the United Nations in the 21st century and Ireland's newfound role within it. And we look to the future of Premier League broadcast rights as the online streaming market continues to disrupt the traditional players and platforms. Taking stock with Vincent Wall. Listen and subscribe to the podcast now or tune in Sunday mornings at 10 on News Talk. Fresh air has never seemed so precious. At Toyota, we believe it's worth protecting, and drivers agree. That's why today, Ireland's best selling car is a Toyota self charging hybrid. Now, with contributions of up to €3,000 and flexible payment options, we're making it even easier to start your electric journey in a Toyota hybrid. Visit our new virtual showroom at toyota.ie or talk to your dealer today. Toyota. Built for a better world. Terms and conditions apply. Weekly Super Savers from Lidl mean delicious meals for your family for less. From Thursday, our fresh Irish chicken breast fillets are down from 4 69 to only 3 50 Extra large cod fillets are only 4 59 And get one kilo of peaches or one kilo of nectarines for only 1 99 At that price, sure, why not both? Lidl. More for you. In 1940, in Oak Park... Our great Granny Brett had four sons. Hungry fellas. So she set them to growing corn to feed the pigs which were raised and cured in Oak Park. Now we two brothers... John and David... Still craft insanely good rashers here in Tipperary, from feel to fry up like Great Granny used to make. And then add some new twists, like Great Granny didn't used to make. Oak Park. Real rashers rediscovered. At VHI, we're adapting to how we can be there when you need us. With a team of health and well-being experts you can access from home. Introducing Health Team Online and our new Health Squad. Health Team Online offers you access to a range of medical specialists who can give you one-to-one -one advice and treatment. And our Health Squad experts will provide you with a free lifestyle program covering everything from fitness to nutrition, sleep to financial matters. Day-to-day -day well-being, all from your home. Health Team Online and Health Squad from VHI. When you need us, we're there. Terms and conditions apply. VHI Healthcare DAC trading as VHI Healthcare is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland and is tied to VHI Insurance DAC for health insurance in Ireland. Funny where one choice takes you. From the edge of making a decision to doing research on the cutting edge. From being bored in your room to being heard in the boardroom. From the CAO to your first day at TU Dublin ready for anything. One choice, infinite possibilities. Choose TU Dublin on your CAO. From teaching them how to ride a bike to brushing their teeth, life lessons really matter. Teaching kids about money is one of the most important. That's where Ulster Bank's Money Sense can help. An online hub with free interactive content to help kids aged 5 to 18 make sense of money. It also has great tips for parents on how to equip their kids with positive money skills that can last a lifetime. Search Ulster Bank Money Sense today. Ulster Bank. Help for what matters. Ulster Bank Ireland DAC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. You know that feeling you get when you sense a team's winning streak is about to end? Or when you know the pundits are getting it all wrong? That feeling? That's me. I'm your hunch. I was there back in Istanbul when you just knew the comeback was on. I'm the guy that tells you when the odds don't look so odd. I'm your hunch. It's time to start listening. Heed your hunch with Betway. Download the app to find out more about Betway's Bet Club. Full terms apply. 18 plus, dunlouis.net, bet the responsible way. The COVID-19 crisis is not over, but the efforts and solidarity of the Irish people means that we can now move to phase three of our reopening roadmap. As we begin to return to normal life, it is more important than ever that we all act responsibly and work together so that we can continue to get Ireland back on its feet. The most important things are the simple things. We must practice good hand hygiene and coughing and sneezing etiquette continue to observe social distancing and avoid crowds where possible. These are the main things you should know for the weeks ahead. 1. Face coverings will be mandatory on public transport and should also be worn in shops and in places where it is hard to maintain social distancing. 2. Travel restrictions in Ireland have been lifted and we can now have gatherings of up to 50 people indoors and 200 outdoors. But non-essential international travel should continue to be avoided. 3. Many more businesses are now open, but business owners must make their premises safe for both staff and customers. 4. Please continue to work from home as much as possible. Use public transport only if necessary, and walk or cycle if you can. Ireland has made huge progress combating the virus, but it's still having a major impact all around the world. 
with some countries experiencing a resurgence. So please be sensible, be responsible, be safe and look out for each other and our communities. Our future is in our hands. We are still in this together. Full details of Phase 3 are available at gov.ie forward slash roadmap. Thank you. Supported by the Government of Ireland. You ain't shit! I wish I was 50 years younger and I'd kick your ass. My fans can be the harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof for the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have, and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as your life, because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not lies. Stephen Rochford has never spoken to Jimmy McGinnis in his life. Right, you're very welcome back to this Saturday's Off the Ball. Neil Tracy here with you until 5 o'clock this evening. Time now, though, for the Saturday panel, where we are reviewing the week that was in sport with uh, Shane Keegan, opposition analyst for Dundalk FC and a podcaster with the 42.e, as well as Michael Verney of the Irish Independent, who are both on the line now, I believe. There you are, guys. Gents, afternoon. How are you doing? How are you keeping, Neil? Neil? So, pretty much only one place we can start for our uh, review of the week. And Liverpool, Thursday night, wrapping up the Premier League title courtesy of Chelsea's win against Manchester City uh, on Thursday evening at Stamford Bridge. Shane, I know you're a Spurs fan, but Michael, I've been told you're a Liverpool fan. Am I right in saying that? Uh, a casual Liverpool fan, Neil, to be honest is, with you. Only is, casual. Is there such not, a not thing? The biggest, not the biggest <laughs> soccer fan in the world, to be honest. Is there such a thing as a casual Liverpool fan? I'd never, I'd never been a been frequented with one of those kind of people before but obviously first time since 1990 their longest gap ever 28th of April 1990 was the last time they won the title I was 20 days old at the time so don't really remember that one but uh, I suppose even when they win the league by a landslide guys there always has to be a bit of drama with Liverpool because you know essentially this was wrapped up by Christmas last year but because of COVID-19 and the pandemic we've you know had football suspended and Obviously, there was there was worry. Was the league going to be completed? Was it going to be declared null and void? Were Liverpool, going to be, Liverpool just going to be given the title and left with a little asterisk beside it? But Shane, obviously, no doubt that they are the um, the worthy winners. And look, I think it doesn't really matter who you support. The last couple of days, you can't help but feel a little bit of a little bit of happiness for for the fans involved, for the players involved, and for Jurgen Klopp, who just seems like an incredibly likable guy. Yeah, yeah. If I've seen once, I've seen a hundred times at this stage. People from other clubs commenting that uh, the manager is so likable, the players are so likable. It's 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 impossible not to like them. It's just a pity. In, in fairness, no. Look, it's 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 great that they haven't finished with an with an asterisk beside them because they are too good of a side for that to happen. You know, they really, really have been absolutely fantastic this season and. Personally, they, like, they fascinate me in two senses. They fascinate me as tactically, I think, Klopp's, you know, the system, the way he goes about things. There's so many different kind of facets of it you could look at. at Michael Cox had a brilliant piece today on The Athletic on it. Um, they're, they're fantastic from that side of things, but also culturally. I mean, the way he has created an atmosphere in there is just incredible. It really, really is incredible. And they just look like a group of players, staff, everybody at that club just seems to get on incredibly well. Yeah, Shane, obviously like yeah, you're Shane, he sure. heavily involved in coaching and management. Uh, more so more so as man management than tactically, would you absolutely just hold Jurgen Klopp up as, as an example of this is the right way to do it? Yeah, 100%, 100%. Look, I know it's easy to jump to those kind of conclusions. Shane's line, would, but... Shane's line is hopping up and down there. We might just get Shane to find maybe a, a different spot in the room to go to. Michael, uh, as we mentioned there, you're, you know, not a huge football fan, you were saying, but like Jurgen Klopp, if we were to just stick on him, because, you know, we've all been coached by various people down the years, whether it's in GA and rugby and soccer, and we've all had good managers and bad managers. When you see something like Jurgen Klopp, like, like what is this you're looking at when you see him and just the respect the players have for him? Yeah, I suppose we've all seen different managers in different spheres and codes where you're just, when you're in the opposition camp, you're so envious. You see what's going on there. You see tactically how astute they are. Uh, you see the bond that they have as a group. Uh, like I saw him, on, I, he was on a dance, a dance floor there the other night 
doing all these crazy moves. And even after when they won the European Cup, he was just basically taking it all in. And you're kind of just thinking he kind of has the perfect balance of the players have unbelievable respect for him. But he's created this unbelievable culture, which he has totally bought into himself. Like I was only thinking last night, we were back training last night uh, for, with, with the hurlers in Burr there. And I was just saying to the lads, imagine if that was a GA manager, you know, on the dance floor, like embracing and something like that. Everyone would nearly be given out. But you have this professional outfit where they're obviously so confident in everything that they do. And they're so together that... There are boundaries, I'm sure, at appropriate times and he's able to give them a bollocking when it's needed. But they also have this unbelievable bond where and they can just totally let loose when they do win. And I just thought it was brilliant even the other night. Uh, I thought it was going to be a bit of an anticlimax, but even just all the Liverpool lads being together in the in the golf club uh, on the 19th hole, as I said, when they won the when they won their 19th uh, Premier League title. I just thought even that was amazing, even something that could have turned into a damn squib that group would never let that happen and the importance of it and the significance of it was still celebrated as it should have been despite the the unprecedented times they didn't win it on the pitch but they uh it was it was as good as any title that was ever won on the pitch the way it was celebrated yeah shane keegan is back with us there shane we were talking about the celebrations but just to go back on jürgen klopp you were kind of midway through a, a point there about just how likable he is and more so the man management style as opposed to tactically yeah, he, he does. He really seems to have nailed everything. Um, Kieran Shannon has a, has a really, really good piece in today's Examiner. I, I, I actually did a, a presentation at the GEA coaching conference earlier this year that was was based around Klopp, Guardiola and Stephen Kenny. And my, I must have done a lot of similar research to Kieran in, in doing it because we've both come to a lot of the same points in terms of, of, of the things that, that Klopp does so well. But I mean, he, he's just been incredible. He really, really has. The way he's, he's created that inclusivity amongst all the players and you know, they, they, they're, they're, they're absolutely the definition of a team, aren't they? They really, really are. Now, look, I think at the same time, that, you know, you remove one or two key players, I suppose, most notably, obviously, Virgil van Dijk from it, and, and you might see a slightly different um, scenario. But, but when they're all there and when they're all working on, on, they just all seem to be working off the same page the whole time, don't they? Mm -hmm. And I just think I uh, on a personal level, he actually just seems to be a perfect fit for the club itself. And for the for the city of Liverpool, just the the way the supporters are, hindsight is absolutely brilliant and all. And you know we can look back at a few years ago, but even looking at it now, he absolutely was just as a person and as a manager the right fit for a club like Liverpool. Yeah, and and I don't think um you know it's as you say it's easy hindsight is certainly the thing, but there would have been maybe a few question marks at the time because obviously things hadn't gone fantastically in that final season with Dortmund. But um, again, you know, there was kind of some really, really interesting articles over the last week or so highlighting how Liverpool had done their homework behind the scenes and, and all XG isn't for everybody, but apparently all the XG data was pointing to the fact that he had been incredibly unlucky that year rather than having transformed into a poor manager, if that makes sense. And uh, look, they knew they were getting the right man. And I mean, you know, you look back, I was just looking, uh, lads, that, like the start, the start Liverpool lineup because it was against Spurs. Klopp's first game was against Spurs, and you look at the start Liverpool lineup in that game: Mignolet in goal, a backline of Klein, Skirtle, Sacco, and Moreno. Midfield three of Milner, Lucas Leva, and Can, and a front three of Coutinho, Origi, Lalana. I mean, that's that's hard to 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 believe that they've gone from that to what we we've, we've seen absolutely march to a Premier League title this year. You know. Yeah, like just yeah, like one player in that entire starting eleven is, you know, part of, probably not even part of a starting Liverpool team at the moment, James Milner, but he's, you know, a, a core part of the squad. But you mentioned how, you know, there probably were a lot of people who were maybe a little bit lukewarm to Jurgen Klopp when he arrived. I know uh, Jackie Cahill, the journalist and communications manager for the Ladies Football Association, he retweeted yesterday, he's obviously a huge Liverpool fan, as anyone who follows him on Twitter would know, but he retweeted from... October the 8th, 2015, Sky Sports News tweeting, Sky sources, Jurgen Klopp agrees to become Liverpool manager. And the replies to it, I know Twitter isn't a great bar barometer sometimes, but the replies are sensational. One here like, he's worse than Rodgers, LMAO, mistake, Liverpool not the big club they think they are anymore. He'll be sacked at the end of the season anyway. Um, rubbish choice, needed someone with experience like Sam Allardyce. <laughs> Worst decision ever, Klopp more like flop. I mean, the list goes on. It's an incredibly long list of 
people talking about how rubbish this appointment was going to be. Which one of them was which one of them was you, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> no, none of them were me anyway. But it's funny just um I, I, as I said, I wouldn't have the massive interest in soccer, but you look at Klopp and you try and see, OK, who is he surrounding himself with? Obviously, he's a brilliant manager, but uh, I think it's Michael Edwards in the background who has seen, like, it's, it's, they seem to have gotten all their transfers on the money. Shane went through the starting 11 from, from five years ago and you're just thinking, like, realistically, if you're comparing, you know, that Liverpool team in 2015 to some of the great Liverpool teams and you're thinking, God, there's there's a lot of kind of passengers or players that they've taken a punt on in the past um, that just haven't really paid off. And then you look at the transfers over the last over the last five years, you know, uh, you know, Salah, Mane, all these players that they've invariably, like, they've had a massive strike rate from what they've invested in over the last four or five years. And that doesn't happen by accident either. And a lot of that to do is to do with what Klopp has surrounded himself by. And I think it's Michael Edwards in the background that has had a massive, uh, a massive bearing on the players that they've gotten, and there's no more like, there's no more signings like Paul Kincheski or these kind of average kind of players that they were taking a punt on. They've really invested uh, very smartly, and they've reaped the rewards. And even just seeing the club isn't isn't really thinking about investing much throughout the summer. They're quite happy with the squad that they have, and that's a, a great place to be in. And it just shows that the investments that they've made have really paid off. Yeah, it's, I think Shane, that probably shows just the. The way they've gone about recruitment over the last few years is that pretty much every signing they've made over the you know since Klopp has come in has been a player that has the attributes to fit into the style of football a Jurgen Klopp team plays. Absolutely, yeah. They've been proven not just to be a great player, but as you said, they've been proven to be a great player for the system and a great player for what they need them to do. Um, and I mean, that's you know obviously again I'd go back to Virgil Van Dijk has been the absolute standout one. I mean, his impact. I don't think you can overstate it. It's 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 been absolutely incredible. You've 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 almost signed two players. You've signed a fantastic centre half, and then you've signed this other guy who has the ability to make all the rest of the players around him, or certainly in his backline, get to another level as well. Um, so his his has been a, a, just a phenomenal sign. Allison's then to really cement that backline and make them all the stronger again. Absolutely fantastic. I think Fabinho. Um, Watching him there again, I mean, the ground that man covers and and the role that he plays within, like, he is he's a truly unique player in world football at the moment. I, I, I've, I, I watch so many games like most football fans do. I don't know anybody else who, who does this. Now, obviously, it's under Klopp's instruction, but this crack of him going uh, from a holding midfield role where he's sitting in front of the back four to essentially pressing the holding midfielder for the opposition when they don't have the ball... He's running from a six position into a ten position every time they don't have the ball to go and 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 be a part of that press that they've become some fa so famous for. And um, I mean, I don't see any other team doing that. I don't see any other player doing that. He, so he he also has been a, a huge huge cog in terms of what they're doing. Yeah. So it's more than so, just you know bombarding them with speed and pace and you know just going gung ho attack. And it it's a lot more subtle than that, is what you're saying. Yeah, it is. Every again, everybody knows their, their their role within the system. Again, as you said, look, I'm I'm involved doing a small bit with with Dundalk, and obviously enough, our manager Vinnie Perth is, is very good there at using clips and examples of of Liverpool and what they're doing and how they go about splitting the field. I mean, again, like when you talk about the uniqueness of this Liverpool side, right? What are they doing different than anybody else? What are they doing better than anybody else? Like Firmino's role within that side, again, is there any other team in world football who have a centre forward with Firmino's skill set? I mean, he, for starters, he's not a centre forward. Well, he is now, but he did He wasn't supposed to be a centre forward when he arrived. But I mean, he's essentially he's a great player. His hold-up play is brilliant. His passing is excellent. He can finish. But the reason he's picked at number nine every week is because of his ability to lead the press. I mean, what other team picks their centre forward on their ability to lead the press? You know, it's it. They're a very very they have a very, very different way of going about things than any, any other team in, in, in certainly in Premier League football at the moment. There is a text in taking issue with, uh, with something. Probably myself and you pointed out, Shane. Uh, that team you listed off nearly won the league under Rodgers. Let's not pretend he took over a bad team. Like, it's only... I would, I would personally say that by the time uh, Brendan Rodgers had left and Jurgen Klopp had come in, they were a much different team to the one that actually nearly won the league two years previously. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And maybe not, um, maybe not hugely in personnel, but they just the way they were playing, the confidence they had, like they had regressed so much in the space of a year. 
Yeah, I, I also don't think it was a league that was as strong in quality as the current league, certainly in terms of when you look at Manchester City. And I also don't think it's a side that would have ha- have gone to, to back-to-back Champions League finals. Um, I mean, look, yeah, Brendan Rodgers, look, we won't go back there. He did, he did a really, really good job too, in fairness to him. And absolutely not saying that it was a, that was a case of, of picking up scraps. But um, at the same time, it's, you know, look at player for player, position for position, I mean, again, you know, the, the two fullbacks and what they've done yet again this season, absolutely sensational. Um, I mean, the only area of the field that you would look and say they're not world class in individually is probably the centre midfielders. And even that's after me praising Fabinho. But at the start of this season, you would have looked and you would have said, OK, why might why do you fancy Man City to win the league ahead of them? And the reason you would have said you fancy Man City to win the league ahead of them is the strength of the midfields. Mm-hmm. But again, this whole thing with Liverpool is it's not based on the individual quality of the player. It's based on what they do as a unit. I will, look, he has about five different players that he can choose his three from there on any given week. And it's just, it doesn't matter which three he picks because they all know the role. They all do the same thing as if you come in, you do exactly what the fellow who wore that jersey did the previous week. They all know those roles inside out. And like, you know, it's they're a cog in a machine, a superbly functional machine. Mm-hmm. That is the voice of Shane Keegan and Michael Verney there as well. We're currently discussing Liverpool's Premier League title win. We'll have more on that later on in the show as well with Dan and Damien Delaney. First, though, we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll have more on the Saturday panel coming up shortly with Shane and Michael. We're going to look ahead at, uh, I suppose, the, the last couple of days in the GA calendar and the news that uh, the you know the systems and formats for the 2020 Championship. All of that as well, though, coming up after the break. Afternoons are easy with insuremyvan.ie, Ireland's low-cost van insurance specialist. Get your business back on the road with insuremyvan's best price guarantee. For super savings, visit insuremyvan.ie. City Financial Marketing Group Limited training as insuremyvan.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Maxus Deliver 9 is the newest name in light commercial vehicles in Ireland distributed by the Harris Group. A van that demands to be driven, the Maxus Deliver 9 range is available now. A complete new platform vehicle of eco technology, high efficiency, low consumption, and a five year warranty. This is the pure driving experience with no compromises. Contact your local Maxus dealer or check out saicmaxus.ie. Maxus. The pure driving experience. Enjoy unlimited cook-alongs, sing-songs, TikToks, Zoom bombs, stories, streaming, gaming, swiping and sharing with no limits data on Air Mobile. And with our retail stores reopening in line with guidelines, why not drop by and chat to our team? To get no limits data with Air Mobile, call 1-800-500-300, go in store or visit air.ie. Air, let's make possible. Unlimited allowances subject to fair use. Available on selected air mobile plans. For full terms, see air.ie. The wait is finally over and sport is back on Now TV. It's lights out and away we go! Where you can watch Sky Sports, Premier Sports and BT Sport together and all without a contract. What a fantastic part. So whether there's a day, week or whole month of action you just can't miss, you can now stream the lot. Oh, it's a fabulous goal! This is your sport on your terms. Search Now TV Sports to find out more. 18 plus content streamed by internet. Full terms apply. The country is on the way to reopening, but the world and our roads have changed since we were last out here. There are now more of us cycling and more of us walking, and there are more reasons to look out for each other. Drivers, please slow down and take care when passing pedestrians and cyclists. Pedestrians, always walk on the footpath. If there isn't one, on the right-hand side of the road facing oncoming traffic. We're on the road back. Make it a safer one. A message from the Road Safety Authority and on If you're all at sea from mealtime ideas, we've landed the answer. Fresh Irish haddock. A delicious, nutritious white fish and it's so versatile. Like grilled haddock with a salad of baby jam, eggs and crispy bacon. Or spiced haddock with lemon couscous. The perfect summer dish. For more delicious meal ideas, visit boardbeer.ie. And next time you're in the supermarket or fishmongers, look out for fresh Irish haddock brought to you by your local fishermen. Fresh ideas, great meals from Board Beer. This is Water Safety Ireland with a message for all parents. While schools are closed, teach your children skills at home to last a lifetime. PAWS is Primary Aquatics Water Safety. It's all the basic water safety skills every child needs. It's free for all ages at teachpaws.ie. That's teachpaws.ie. 
www.ireland.ie, an initiative of the Government of Ireland. You know that feeling you get when you sense a team's winning streak is about to end? Or when you know the pundits are getting it all wrong? That feeling? That's me. I'm your hunch. I was there back in Istanbul when you just knew the comeback was on. I'm the guy that tells you when the odds don't look so odd. I'm your hunch. It's time to start listening. Heed your hunch with Betway. Download the app to find out more about Betway's Bet Club. Full terms apply. 18 plus, dunlouis.net. Bet the responsible way. It's time to trade up to a new Peugeot at Gowan Motors Navan Road. Right now, selected Peugeots come with Peugeot Drive Time. That means Peugeot ads, flexible payment options, five-year warranty, and up to €500 Euro deposit contribution or up to €3,750 scrappage allowance. Available now at Gowan Motors Navan Road. Terms and conditions apply. Come on, Tom. Are you nearly finished hanging that plasterboard? I'm going as fast as I can, but... Have you not heard? The Tech 7 adhesive and sealant lads have introduced a new foam adhesive. Tech 7 Foam Tech. Oh, Foam Tech? I heard people talking about that all right. Well, you should be using that. Tech 7 Foam Tech is super strong. Quick and easy to use, inside or outside. You're right. I'm out of here. Home early. Nah, to the builder's merchants to buy my Tech 7 Foam Tech, of course. Tech 7 Foam Tech. Available now at your local builder's merchants. News Talk already gives you your daily fix of news and entertainment. But wouldn't you like a little bit more? News Talk Extra is everything you might have missed. Plus expert tips, podcasts and competitions. All straight to your inbox. Subscribe now at newstalk.com slash extra. Across Ireland. Across Ireland. This is the Imro Radio Awards Station of the Year. This is is News Talk. It's two o'clock good afternoon. I'm Eamon Torsney. To be elected to serve as Taoiseach of a free republic is one of the greatest honours which anyone can receive. Fianna Fáil leader Micheál Martin has been elected Taoiseach by the Doyle. 93 TDs voted in favour of his appointment. He's now travelling to Orosanuk the Ron, where he'll be given his seal of office by President Higgins. The new Taoiseach will take up his office in government buildings and begin appointing ministers. In an emotional Doyle speech, Micheál Martin said he would not have achieved anything without his family. I want to thank the deputies of my party for their support and also those of Fine Gael and the Green Party as well as those independent deputies who voted for me. Most of all, I want to thank my family and my community. A number of independent TDs outlined their preferences for Taoiseach in the chamber this morning. As expected, the government has secured support from some, but not all. I have decided to make my contribution to stability by supporting the nomination of <coughs> Michal Martin for Taoiseach. I cannot support the pro programme for government because of a number of reasons. Your programme lacks actions. It lacks vision. Well, Labour leader Alan Kelly says his party's goal in the next Doyle is to provide a credible left option for the public. Those who believe in social democratic principles, that they are represented, truly represented by a party of the left, uh, and a credible party of the left, not a populist party. In other news, a body has been found in Belfast in the search for missing teenager Noah Donoghue. The PSNI says the body was recovered in the north of the city just before 9.45 this morning, and it's believed to be that of the 14-year-old. The teenager had been missing since Sunday. Police say they're providing support to his family at this difficult time. And it's claimed the travel industry is being unfairly treated as a pariah in taking action to stop the spread of COVID-19. Chief Medical Officer Dr Tony Holohan says he fears that many people are planning foreign trips and is urging everyone to stay in Ireland. Pat Dawson from the Irish Travel Asso Agents Association doesn't believe the sector should be blamed for potential spikes of COVID-19. With countries that are closed down, the cases are getting worse because the people of the country are not doing what the medical professions are telling them to do. It's two minutes past two. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. For great value home insurance, go online to the AA.ie. Well, some bright spells today, but a good deal of cloud overall with showers or longer spells of rain. Highest temperatures 14 to 17 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Saturday panel on Off the Ball.
All right, you're very welcome back to this Saturday's Off the Ball. Neil Tracy here with you until five o'clock this evening. We're in the company of Shane Keegan, opposition analyst for Dundalk FC and podcaster as well, and Michael Verney from the Irish Independent for our review of the week on the Saturday panel this week. A reminder as well, we're streaming live across all of our social platforms at Off the Ball to follow that, and also on the new OTV Sports app. And get your texts into us on 53106 earlier on in the Saturday panel. We were talking about Liverpool's Premier League title success. And we'll probably carry this on for a little bit and move on towards the GA. First, though, a goal has been scored in today's only Premier League game. Aston Villa taking on Norwich at Aston Villa. And with the details of this goal of Villa Park is Tom Gale. Oh. OK, we don't have that goal, unfortunately. Uh, I can tell you it is 1-0 to Wolves. Uh, Leander Den Donker scoring on 62 minutes. So Wolves leading that game by a goal to nil against Aston Villa. And as things stand, they would move three points ahead of Manchester United into fifth place in the table. United would be back on sixth on 49 points, while Aston Villa would remain in big, big trouble back in 19th place on 27 points. A point for them that today would see them climb out of the relegation zone, albeit temporarily. Now, guys, before we wrap up on Liverpool, I suppose just the final point on it, and it probably links into so much hope and expectation around GA teams in the Championship, is that a story like Liverpool winning the Premier League title, one thing you can appreciate it for is that it shows a sport is more than just the kind of the facts and figures, the numbers, the results. It's about the journey. It's about 30 years of frustration, of anger, of accepting defeat and, you know, getting excited, near misses with, with title hopes and stuff like that. And all of those 30 years, they add to the journey. Yeah, yeah, look, they certainly do. I think, um, you know, when you had the dominance of, of United under Ferguson and you got used to the same team winning it kind of the vast majority of seasons, I suppose... That, that special feeling kind of, I'm sure, didn't disintegrate for them or, or, or disintegrate anywhere around. But but as us watching on, um, that special feeling probably didn't carry as much weight. But uh, as I say, look, whether you're a Liverpool fan or, or not, I think everybody has has kind of bought into it this year because they've they've, they've been off the off that that top spot for so so long. Um, now look, I'd still I'd still have my gripe with our uh, with the hardcore Liverpool support over here that that maybe. You know, seem to maybe go over the top of it a, a little bit, a little bit. But I, I suppose none of us are, are the most gracious of winners either, are we? What are the What are the little bits? Tell us the little bits that are grating you. Ah, sure. Come on, this is this is an open this is an open forum. Share with us. We're among friends here, Shane. Look, you know, it, it's it's the League of Ireland head in me, I suppose. So it is. You know how uh, I still can't wrap my head around how somebody could get as emotional or as wrapped up in in something like that as as you would do if your own uh if your own to use your comparison as if you uh, how could it feel the same as if your own county won in all ireland or or if, even if your own league of ireland side won a title when you're you know you're part of that club and you're there week in week out i, I just can't see how it could be emotion on the same level to be honest with you yeah i don't know i like i do think and michael i don't know you can chip in and, and tell me your own thoughts on this but like for a lot of people in the country, there isn't a League of Ireland club anywhere near them. They may as well be supporting Liverpool rather than whatever their their closest League of Ireland team, because they may, you know, what's the difference between fifty miles and two hundred miles really at the end of the day? But also, I think for a lot of people, you're born into it. Some like a lot of people, they didn't just decide at the age of thirteen or fourteen. You know what? I'm going to be a Liverpool fan today. For a lot of them, it was they came out of the womb and their mother or father you know, were diehard fans of Liverpool or Manchester United or whoever and decided that's you. It's it's stamped on your backside pretty much from, from the day you're born. Yeah, just just on Shane's point, I think it's interesting. You know the famous Vox Pop that was done there on O'Connell Street uh, <laughs> with, 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 with your man who's going on about, you know, St. Patrick's Athletic and he, you know, he hits his chest and all that kind of crack and he says, uh, he says he, how he finds it unusual that, you know, People, you know, support the Irish national team, and but yet they don't support the League of Ireland club, and they, all their affiliations with regards to clubs are with an English club. And it, it is interesting. Um, I know for people that don't support Liverpool, I know from even chatting them, even some hacks and that they're absolutely like 
gone to 90 w- with all these articles that have been done in Liverpool, uh, personal experiences by, by various jur- journalists and things like that. It doesn't really bother me. If it was if it was a GA style kind of thing, it probably would bother me. But I, I totally buy into Shane's point. But I probably fit into to what you were saying, Neil, there. Like, at Lone Town would have been the, the closest club to me. And uh, I, I, I've never seen that Lone Town play. And I wouldn't be close to... I wouldn't. I, I haven't been to a League of Ireland game, um, shamefully. It's something that's that's on the bucket list at some stage, but I just don't know if I have the interest to be going to it. But I totally understand Shane's point. It's like, um, you know, it's like how do, it's funny. Like people t- are getting as much enjoyment out of Liverpool winning the the Premier League as as much, if not more, enjoyment as their county winning on All Ireland, which is hard to kind of get my head around in in many ways. But listen, uh, whatever floats their boat. Speaking of all Ireland, we'll get to that now. Also a texter as well. Well said, Shane Keegan, regarding getting so emotional over a team from another country. That is from Johnny. Uh, I don't know if it's a Johnny Ward or not. It probably <laughs> is. <laughs> <Who knows? laughs> it is. Probably is. Probably is. And also that another one. Luis Suarez was the reason Liverpool nearly won the league in 2014. He was gone when Klopp took charge. He did not inherit a good team. That one is from Brian. But we will move on towards Gaelic games because, as Michael mentioned, you know, getting excited over over your county winning something that is something that is uh, going to be happening over the next few months. Teams back in training, club teams anyway, officially club teams uh, this week, and we had the details. We had some white smoke yesterday. Just to recap for people who missed it. The All-Ireland Finals, hurling final this year is going to be December 13th and then Saturday the 19th will be the football, the football championship, straight knockout, no backdoor or no Super 8s. The hurling is going to be a provincial knockout with qualifiers and a quarter final. The Munster hurling draw was redone yesterday, Clare against Limerick in the quarters, winner of that faces Tipperary in the semi-finals with Cork and Waterford on the other side. Then the Leinster draw, Kilkenny versus Leash or Dublin in the semi-finals and Wexford versus Galway. Also as well, there's going to be no club provincials or All-Ireland series and no punishments for counties as well, breaking the rules on training. So we've plenty to get through in all this. Uh, Michael, we'll start with you, I suppose. First of all, All-Ireland finals, December 13th and 19th. Not sure how you're feeling about it. We were talking about it in the newsroom. Considering it's a one-off, I was anyway... I actually cannot wait to see what it's going to be like having All-Ireland finals in the couple of weeks before Christmas. The buzz is just going to be phenomenal. Asher, it's set up for Mayo to win the All-Ireland this year <laughs> and for them to be celebrating over Christmas. It's absolutely set up for it. I think, uh, like, it's, like, we didn't think we were going to be in this scenario a couple of months ago and it was kind of a doomsday kind of an outlook. So I, I think it's great. Um, the people, I don't subscribe to the, you know, the winter hurling or winter football aspect of it. While conditions are obviously going to be a lot different, invariably all these big games are going to be played in, in unbelievable grounds. Be it the majority will probably be played in Semple Stadium, and once you get down to the knockout, knockout, you're probably looking at Crow Park. Uh, there's definitely an interesting uh, thing after happening in the Munster Championship, though. I think the Munster draw the way they're after doing it is all over the place. So Limerick and Limerick and Tipperary were, were the finalists last year. Obviously, uh, Limerick League champions, All Ireland semi finalists, Tipperary, uh, Tipperary All Ireland champions. But you have the winners of the winners of Limerick and the winners of Limerick and Clare facing off against Tipperary in a semi final. So like I just think, and then you have Cork and Waterford on the other side. The whole Munster draw is completely stacked. On, on one side. So Tipperary are awaiting either either Clare or Limerick in a semi-final. For, Li- for Limerick, it's going to be an unbelievably tough passage through. And then on the other side, you have Cork and Waterford and you're thinking, well, Cork didn't do anything last year. Limerick or Waterford didn't do anything last year. And you're thinking, what the two Munster, semi- Munster finalists from last year, you're thinking surely that they'd be seeded on opposite sides of the draw. But it, it, it hasn't happened that way for whatever reason. Um, there's a couple of other interesting things after happening as well. Um, while it's great that the county championships are happening and are all going to be played off before Christmas, the fact that the, the All-Ireland Club Series, the Provincial and All-Ireland Club Series has been scrapped, I, I'm, I can't really get my head around that one. And they're saying about time and rest and things like that. The semi, All-Ireland Club semi-finals were played in January this year and have traditionally been played up until Patrick's Day. I wouldn't have seen any issue with playing the Leinster Club Championship in January and then playing the All-Ireland semi-finals and final in early to mid-February rather than getting rid of them. They're saying like it's to do with time, but this has traditionally been always the way that the semi-finals have been played off at that time of the year and the final. I, I wouldn't see any issue with continuing with that. And then from a school's point of view, uh, my own former school, St. Brendan's and Borough, were in the All-Ireland College's B final against Cashel and that's not going to be played now. 
Um, I'm not. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why they couldn't find uh, a day somewhere where they could play that. And a lot of the other uh, secondary schools fixtures that were nearly at the nearly at the end of their championships aren't going to be played as well. Um, I, I definitely think. I definitely think there's a few losers in it. But from an overall picture, having the county back and getting it done before Christmas, it, it's great. And it's great. It's we're usually in club season at that time of the year. That's usually what we're focusing on. It's going to be a different focus this year, club during the summer, county in the winter. But it's, it's going to be great. Like, you know, Christmas will absolutely fly this year. Yeah, like, just to go back on the, you know, the Provincial and All-Ireland Club Series being scrapped, um, I don't know, my take on it would be, obviously it's hugely unfortunate, but surely there is an element that they do have to conserve time because once the, the county championships are played as such, we're straight into the inter-county season, which is going to be fairly, fairly short as well. So if you were to restart the club campaigns in January, you're still having to play through those uh, those provincial knockout stages as well before you actually get into the All-Ireland series, where normally we would have just had the, the All-Ireland semi-finals in, uh, in both the football and hurling club seasons. But also as well, I think you would have been in a situation where this season in particular, there would have been so many, there would have been so many games and so many championships, be it club and county, crammed into such, such a short period of time, even though they would be taking place in January as they normally would, there has to probably be a bit of a layoff for, for teams just to, to get that bit of a rest again. I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I genuinely don't buy that argument because mo mostly a lot of those county players have been flat out for the whole year. It's to say TJ Reid has been flat out for the whole year with club and county. And like playing an extra couple of games, I, I think they're, they're the ones that are losing out. The county champions are going to basically lose out. They're the only county champions in, his, in the last 40 years that aren't going to get to play at provincial level. I, I don't see that as an issue. Like they're talk, It's almost like player burnout is an issue now, uh, whereas they've just kind of avoided that issue in previous years. Plus, if county champions, county champions win their, their title in October and they have a three-month break until January to come back, like that's that's what happens. That's what used to happen before all Ireland semi-finals. Anyway, you were winning your county, your provincial championship at the end of November, and you weren't playing again until February. So I kind of think I kind of think they're they're changing their outlook on that to kind of suit them in this instance. But I do think the county champions are are being left out. I I think it's I think it's more than unfortunate to be honest with you. Shane, your own thoughts on that? Yeah, like I mean, what do you normally have in January? Like looking again from our own perspective here in Leash, you've got kind of Mickey Mouse things like the Walsh Cup and, and, and stuff like that. I mean, which would you rather see in, in January? You know, Walsh Cup fixtures or, or Leinster Club finals and All-Ireland Club finals? You know, I, I'd be fully with Michael on that side of things. I, I think there surely could have been some form of a rejig. And there seems to be an obsession with everything having to have finished within the calendar year this year as well, for some reason, which I, I, I just can't wrap my head around. And, you know, again, not too far up the road from me, um... Port Leash, I mean, again, if I look at Port Leash, Port Leash would be odds on to win their own club championship again this year. Look, it's far from a given, but if they do, that's the end of the road for them. I mean, Port Leash would start out most years knowing, okay, we have got a battle in our hands here in our own place, but, you know, we probably fancy ourselves and our big aim is to see how far can we go in, in Leinster and beyond that. I mean, all that's gone on them now, you know? Michael, you're obviously a, a club player and as we had that club discussion as well, one thing that has been fairly... Uh, has been talked about over the last few days as well. Inter-county teams, I, I specifically actually haven't heard of any named counties that have been breaking this training ban. But from what I hear anecdotally, everyone seems to be at it, is the general consensus. But the GA yesterday pointing out they aren't going to punish counties for uh, breaking the rules on inter-county training if they return before September the 14th. If they're not going to punish counties for actually doing it, what is the point in actually saying you can't do it before September the fourteenth? If we're not yeah. if we're not actually going to do anything to you if we find out you have done it, it's kind of like the the old winter training band that they used to have. It was there, but nobody, everybody flouted it and broke it, but no one was out, there was out, never any repercussions for it. Like the only way to to put something like that in place is to have some sort of some sort of action that they will take be it the team, the county been thrown out of the championship or be it a hefty fine or something like that. That is literally the only way to go about it. Like I have heard all sorts and from very good sources of different counties and what's going on in counties. I know in one fairly predominant hurling county, the club managers have railed against the county manager basically because the county manager uh, is 
you know, organising his training sessions on one night and then they're going to the club and maybe they can't train with the club. So the county managers or the club managers have come together within that county and basically put a roadblock up in front of the county manager. And there's very little the county manager can do there. He has all the club managers against him now and he, he basically is going to have to play by those rules. I've heard, uh, well, it's more than it's more than heard. It's very hard evidence that there's, there's some county teams want their county players four nights a week to train for their inter-county, for their inter-county football team. And... The club has totally been left behind uh, in in that instance, and it, that like to get back to some sense of normality after this kind of unprecedented scenario where we've been in. Everybody just just get back to your club, and you talk, you hear about people saying like ninety eight percent of GA players are club players, one hundred percent of GA players are club players. That's where they'll start. That's where they'll finish. They wouldn't be with their county were it not for the development and time that was put into them at club level. And are you telling me that, you know, a county manager is going to have call over those guys coming up to big club games? It's it's ridiculous. We're going back to the old, we haven't had any sort of normality in the last three months. Normality now is lads going back to their club, uh, communities getting back to normal. L- lads been able to go into the field maybe in the next month or two, watch young lads train and watch senior teams training. And it's so important that the county players are there within those clubs, driving it forward, not standing on the sideline because they've had a hard session with the county, you know, illegally the night before. And I just think a, a harder line needs to be told on this. There's so much ambiguity in it now. They're basically basically telling county managers, they're basically telling them to go and do whatever they want to do. And I give there's there's county teams training in golf courses. There's some county training teams training across bogs, training in parks doing all sorts of this crack and the club is the one is the the part of it that's going to lose out as a result of it and if you don't tow a hard line at it, and, a G, and the GPA are basically saying that county teams need to be insured before September the 14th um, if they do go back is kind of feeding into it as well because basically saying yes they are back and they need to be insured but they're not supposed to be back. Shane I might put you into your manager's hat here now for just a moment if someone had said to you you know your governing body says to you we don't want you to come back training until a certain date, but if you do actually start back, we're not going to punish you whatsoever. What would you be doing? Yeah, well, Neil, like there's 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 precedent there already. I mean, with any rule in any walk of life, there's a rule, and then what do you want to know after you hear the rule? You want to hear what's the repercussions of breaking the rule. Simple as that, all right? And then you can weigh up yourself whether it's worth breaking the rule or not. I mean, there's umpteen, umpteen examples of, of county managers... <sighs> How, mu- how much do we get fined if we're, if we're five minutes late back out onto the pitch at, after the halftime break? Okay, that amount, yeah, no bother. I know a businessman who'll cover that for us. There's no bother. We'll, we'll do our own thing. Or, you know, what, what is the repercussion? Can we handle the repercussion? Yeah, we can handle it, so we'll just break the rule. When they're told there is literally no repercussion, so there's only one outcome. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good way of putting it. Um, Michael, you were saying you went back training with the club there the other night. How did that feel? I, I know it was fantastic. I'm not involved with a GA club, but I did love on Twitter there just a few videos that I might have come across throughout the day of a lot of GA clubs were they were filming themselves, you know, cutting down the little sign up on the you know the pitch closed until further notice sign or unlocking the gates, and it actually just was really really heartening to see it all happen. Yeah, it was great. It was kind of like we come from a farming background, and the cattle would be in the sheds in the slatted sheds for four or five months, and when they get out and see grass, they just go absolutely crazy. <laughs> And that's kind of that's kind of what, what this was like. <laughs> like what it's like once the gates are open, it's like oh my god, this freedom of a pitch that you ha- that you haven't seen, and it's all grand doing bits and pieces and parts, but being led into been led into your pitch and even being able to take shots at goalposts again was unreal. And just being around lads and everything, and it was funny. Like I've been playing club for the last probably 15 years or that, and it was like been pre- getting prepared for a game, going back training properly on Wednesday night. It just had that kind of nervous excitement all day. Um, but just a bit nervous how something you've done for so long and you haven't been able to do it for three or four months it was great to be back at it uh, great to be in amongst everybody again we were doing it in groups of 15 so there was 15 training on one end of the field 15 training on the other end of the field and then we came in an hour after them and we, we trained on one end of the pitch as well it was, it was brilliant it's, it's obviously different you're trying to keep distance with people where, po- where possible. There was no physical contact or anything like that, and you're bringing in your own water bottle and your own hand sanitizer and things like that, and you're coming in through one gate and exiting through that gate, so you're avoiding everybody else. But yeah, it was just it was it was brilliant to be back. And I suppose 
like a month or six weeks ago, we didn't think it was going to happen. We definitely didn't think it was going to be as accelerated as it is. So it's been unreal. And, but there is a little worry, especially like I'm, I'm over 30 now and you kind of see you're nearly going to be training or playing a match every second day now up until our championship starts back at the end of July. So there are going to be a, an awful lot of injuries along the way. So you kind of have to be cute because it's nearly going to be, in all the county championships, it's nearly going to be the team that can keep their 15 on the pitch and keep them fit. Uh, or probably their 20 players are going to be the ones that end up champions. But yeah, it's 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 uh, it's deadly to be back. What was the the guidance and advice like before you actually went back training the other night? Was it, you know, was it a big detailed plan? Here's exactly how things are going to happen. Here's what you need to do prior to the training session. Here's what you need to do afterwards. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so we all had to do the the e learning. Uh, it's like an e learning portal on GA. E about twenty or twenty five minutes, just making sure you know everything to do with COVID and all the symptoms and basically everything you should do. Then you, you get that done. You get your certificate for that. Uh, before every training, you fill in a questionnaire and you're just making sure, ticking all the boxes to make sure you don't have any symptoms or you haven't been around anyone that has any symptoms. And then you're basically, you kind of relodge that before every training session. But there are going to be issues down the line, without a doubt. Like anecdotally, I've heard of one club that's, that, that could possibly be gone into a bit of lockdown already. It's only anecdotal kind of evidence that I've heard. But like, what's going to happen if you know, a club, a club in Offaly, say three or four players get it or are symptoms of it on the, the eve of a big game. Um, is that whole team going to be pulled out of the championship? Is the championship going to be delayed? It's it's definitely going to happen in different places. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens when it does happen. Shane, the lads in Dundalk, I presume, and the you know Bohemians, Shamrock Rovers, and Derry City as well. They're probably well used to it now. At this stage, they've been back at it for a few weeks and. Uh, you know, probably used to the testing now, and fortunately as well, the you know the amount of testing it does seem to be doing its job. No, no cases to report so far, which is all great stuff. Yeah, yeah, it has, and and believe it or not, I I had to be involved in that testing myself as a member of staff. So I, I was getting tested every every Monday and Thursday myself, um, having to head all the way up up to Dundalk, um, just for that. I mean, the experience itself. Wasn't too bad to be honest with you. People seem to have issue with 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 the swab or with the the uh, it happening through the nose. It was always done through our throat, and it, it was fine to be honest with you. It was done and dusted in 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 less than ten seconds. The lady who was performing it was 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 great. Um, but yeah, it was look, it was great. I I'd be over Port Leash in the um. Leinster Senior League as well, and that's probably a more a more like for like comparison with, with with Michael going back with the club. Um, we'd have a similar setup there in terms of the rules and rules and regulations, and having sat through that um that 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 bit of a lesson on what you do and what you don't do that Michael was talking about. And look, there's some mad stuff there that you can see why it's done. Um, but people find ways and means around it. I mean, probably the craziest one for for us is the fact that uh. That players that aren't from the same household can't can't drive into the car park in the same car. So it's just great crack seeing the car pulling up ten meters down the road and the boys jumping out of the car and walking the final ten meters before walking into the door of the complex. You know. <laughs> um, quickly as well, we'll obviously be talking about this a little bit more with Dan later on in the show as well. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be positive tests that are holding back a, a return for the League of Ireland. What's um what's your take been over the last few days? How much have you been? been in the loop over the discussions that have been happening yeah look trying to keep as updated as possible and there's no doubt in fairness to dan he's, he's been top drawer on that front he's very much at the, the forefront of it we tend to get our, our news through dan rather than through any official sources nearly to be honest with you and um yeah look it's a mad one again just with the selfish hat of looking at it from a, a dundalk point of view obviously we we're going to have a, a champions league qualifier um in the middle of august so, you know, we need football back as quickly as possible. It would be a, a horrible scenario for us to find ourselves in a situation where our first competitive game back was was a game in, in a Champions League qualifier of that importance. Um, so we, we need a resolution to be found very, very fast um, so that the proposed date of, of the beginning of July, that it can't, I mean, from our perspective, we, we need that date to go ahead. Absolutely, we need that date to go ahead. Problem, obviously, is... You know, you've got so many clubs with so many different agendas. I mean, there's me straight straight away putting putting across what's best for Dundalk rather than what's best for the league, I suppose. Um, and everybody's going to be doing the same. I think I think it's inevitable that the only way this can happen is that, that the FAI impose some sort of a, a structure on it themselves. I, I can't see how they're going to get consensus from, from clubs with so many different um, agendas of their own, you know. Yeah, it's the problem with democracy, isn't it, Shane? 
There you are, absolutely. <laughs> Finally as well, before we wrap things up as well, uh, quickly, Michael, I know you're, uh, I don't know, are you heading to the Curragh today, working for the for the Dubai Duty Free Irish Derby, but you mentioned leading up to this, Rachel Blackmore obviously is riding in the uh, in the Derby. Most people would know her pretty much from the National Hunt Circuit, but she's on the 66 to 1 shot, King of the Throne today. Uh, you wanted to speak about her? Yeah, no, it's just uh, really interesting. The Derby's obviously on today. I am. I'm heading on, heading on to to the Curra after I do this. I was in, I was in Limerick last week. It was, it was very uh, a surreal, kind of weird atmosphere. Uh, the quality of racing wasn't particularly good, so it was just, it was very strange. It just made me kind of think that uh, GA behind closed doors without people would be unbelievably soulless and kind of go against everything the kind of GA uh, is all about. But just on, just on today. Yeah, Rachel Blackmore is a phenomenon. She won a, her first kind of big flat race last week. She obviously is world-renowned as, as a brilliant, brilliant jump jockey, really come into her own in, in the last couple of years. But she she has a ride on, on Emmett Mullins' King of the Throne. I think it's probably an unfortunately named horse, the fact that she's riding it in particular. <laughs> but uh, outside her of 14, a really interesting race, um, much like the, the Irish 2000 Guineas and the Irish 1000 Guineas a couple of weeks ago, dominated by the O'Briens. Aidan has six runners, Joseph has two, and Dunica, who's only 21, has has one runner in it as well. So there's there's five other trainers going against them. But R Rachel getting the leg up on, on King of the Throne is, is remarkable, really. Uh, I think she's the third female to ride in a classic race after Anna O'Brien and Joanna Morgan, and it just shows just how how good she is to be given the to given be given the vote of confidence to ride in, in a classic race. In like while she's while she's a brilliant rider over jumps and that to ride on the flat is a, a bit more different the psychology of the the race is even more different it just shows you how good she is to be given the confidence to do that and she's on she's on a horse that that's a five race maiden hasn't hasn't uh, hasn't won a race in five but wouldn't be a bit surprised if she if she coaxes uh, king of the throne into into one of the places and another interesting aspect joseph o'brien has a horse running called New, New York Girl, a filly actually, and uh, no filly has won the Irish Derby since 1994 when Frankie de Tory won on Balanchine. So uh, lots of interest in little subplots. Uh, a brilliant, really, really top class days racing at the Curry. I'd, I'd encourage anyone to, to take a look. Probably the last two races of the day are the best two. The Derby's on at 7.15 and you have last year's Irish Derby hero, Sovereign, running in the last race at 7.45 as well. Classic days races and just... Rachel Blackmore, you'd really have to have the tip to hat to her. She, uh, her talent seems to know no bounds. Michael Verney, thanks a million. So that's the Dubai Duty Free Irish Derby, 7.15 p.m. this evening at the Curra. First of eight races there goes off at 4.15, though. So, Michael Verney, Shane Keegan, thanks a million for joining us this afternoon. Cheers, Nate. Cheers. That, Cheers. That was our review of the week's Saturday panel. I can tell you the full-time whistle has gone at uh, Villa Park in the Premier League, where Wolves have